Welcome back to Mineral Live, everybody. Today we're covering the thermal system of the Rivian R1T. And we have myself, I'm Corey, and we have Alex. Hi. And an interesting uh, aspect of Alex's job here, you are an intern from Kettering University. I was an intern at Kettering University 17 and a half years ago I started at Monroe. So thank you for being with us. We have a team of nine interns at Monroe, and you have been highlighted in several videos. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Let's get right into it. So my initial assessment of the thermal system for the Rivian R1T is that it's executed well with off-the-shelf components. Now, what I mean by that is there's no world-beating octo-valve or high-level of integration. We have off-the-shelf pumps, off-the-shelf uh, chillers. You have a standard condenser for your refrigerant, a standard heat exchanger for the ethylene glycol. We have two off-the-shelf valves, a three-way and a two-way, a standard evaporator, for cooling the cabin and a PTC heater that is uh, that generates heat, a positive temperature coefficient with this high voltage input right here. This kind of reminds me of many of the components we saw when we first tore down the Model 3 with the Super Bottle before it had the octo valve and the heat pump system. And this is not a heat pump system. And we also want to look at all the lines. So the material choice for the lines is primarily PA12, nylon 12, with quick connects on most of the components. But now I'm going to let Alex go through some of the finer details that she found when she worked on this. So Alex, you want to kick it off with any piece that you want? Yeah, absolutely. So since you mentioned the connectors, I think I'll kick it off here. As you can see, this line has two different types of connectors. We have one standard connector that's used on most of the coolant lines and then another with a spring light connector over here. And that's due to the fact that this, um, bleh, pardon me, this line in particular goes in between the DC-DC converter and the onboard charger. Both of these modules, there are two of them, would be sitting on top of the onboard charger, and then these would be interfacing in between them. And what's kind of interesting is that these hoses are kind of designed for like rubber hoses. They're not really designed for coolant lines. So this is more of like an off the shelf part with this fix, adding like a spring lock around it in order to keep it in place. That way it can still function as part of the coolant system, but it's also able to use off the shelf parts, which is a little bit cheaper when all things are said and done. Uh, this is a coolant filter. You'd see it on like the front fascia just behind where I forgot the name of it right now, the AC compressor, well, that's sitting inside the vehicle. And we believe, or our team has come to the conclusion that there may have been some sort of particulate left over from different coolant plating. And in order to ensure that it doesn't run into other parts of the vehicle, there's just a coolant filter within the middle of that system just to make sure it doesn't mitig mitigate any damage if that was to occur. So it's probably put in there as kind of like a fail safe. They may have not have time to test every part of the coolant system to make sure that there's no particulate ahead of time. And this is just a good uh, safety thing to throw in there. So that way you make sure that the coolant system is yeah. running all right. And our team has not seen this before. On all other thermal systems we've seen, PHEV, HEV, and BEV, we've never seen an inline filter. So oh, wow. Part of the reasoning is we think that some of the spaces are so small in the battery for the flow that they don't want that getting clogged up. So it's, it's an expensive piece that may be eliminated in the future if they can get that under control, but right now it's there. All right, Alex, what's next? What do you want to talk about? Um, I think I want to talk about this three-way valve. Um, this is used as a controller in order to direct coolant flow to the batteries or away from the, ba the batteries, depending on whether or not the system itself is in a heating or cooling cycle. So when it's in a cooling cycle, you can kind of see from the gearbox here, this um, will move back and forth. There's a little motor in here that interfaces with these gears. Oh, my bad, the motor's right here. I thought it was on the coolant side. So this will move. Uh, I guess I'll try to visualize it in this way. There's like a small portion within this housing that's able to either unlock this line or block off this line and open either of those two up. So as coolant flows through the system, it can either direct flow straight into the batteries or move the flow back into the whole of the system. If the batteries need more cooling, it'll just slide over so that way the batteries can get a more direct flow of coolant. Now for this system to generate heat, to warm up the battery, there is no inline PTC heater for the fluid. So uh, many of the 
traditional OEMs, we'll see a PTC heater that's going to heat up the fluid to then provide that warmth to the battery, particularly in cold weather scenarios. They're not doing that on this vehicle. So Alex, where, where are they getting that heat from? Um, they're actually taking it from the refrigerant loop in the system. By running that in reverse, they're able to um, create heat within that system and interface the coolant with this heat exchanger. So the coolant will run through at the same time that the hot refrigerant is running through and by extension heating up the coolant so that way it can flow, uh, pardon me, that way it can flow all the way through the system. Are they also gathering some heat from the stators from the motor as well? Isn't that yeah. correct? Yes, yeah. they are. So they're able to take heat from the motors because obviously, obviously they're heating up as the vehicle begins to drive and pulling that heat from the motors in through the chillers. That way it interfaces with the coolant again. Oh, sorry, the refrigerant again, and that yeah. way it can heat up the cabin. So you called it a chiller, but when a chiller works in reverse, essentially it becomes a heater. Because yes. um, if you're passing the TXV, the thermal expansion valve, um, that will create um, refrigerant because it evaporates. Uh, no, it goes from high pressure to low pressure. But if you avoid passing through the TXV, it is hot. So they're pulling heat out of there. That's very cool. I didn't know that before we started this video. So thanks for that. And now we want to get into how the cabin's cooled. So the, how the cabin is cooled is just basic. This is how it would work in any even traditional internal combustion engine vehicle that's spinning um, a mechanical um, AC compressor. You have a thermal expansion valve right here. Um, it builds up pressure. You're going to pull some heat out in the condenser. Then that will come up to here. It'll expand past here. And as it passes through the evaporator, it'll get really cold. You blow air over that, you get AC and then it'll return to the system. So this is a generic evaporator. This is how you would get AC in your Rivian R1T. Nothing too groundbreaking here. Uh, now we're gonna talk about how the, the refrigerant, or the, sorry, the ethylene glycol flows through the batteries. So um, do you wanna go into detail here? I believe there's two lines that run down the battery and then they end up cooling all of the different modules in parallel, is that correct? Yes, that's true. So when all of these are connected together, they're taken apart at this time. They make two long modules, as you said, down the center of the battery, one going into the battery and one, one pulling them out. And it actually moves pretty slowly, if I'm not mistaken, through the battery in order to make sure that it has even cooling throughout. So every part of the battery should be able to get cooled an even amount, even though the coolant lines are running through the center. Yeah, that makes sense to me because you have this one line coming in and then it's splitting that pressure through all of the modules. How many modules are in the battery? I think there's nine. Yes, there are. There's nine modules. So it's one ninth the, the pressure or flow through these, these little, little lines. And then it flows through the seven millimeter cooling plate, which is in between the batteries uh, that are, that's a double layer batteries. You have 2170s on the top, 2170s on the bottom, and they're all touching the seven millimeter cooling plate. So very interesting. And do you want to talk about anything else from about the pipes, how they flow? Maybe there's a restrictor or temp sensors? Um, well, not quite a restrictor, but more of an informal one. The coolant system is also used to cool the ADOS board, which is kind of the car computer. It controls everything in the vehicle. And this line goes directly to the ADOS. And as you can see, it's a bit smaller. It's a bit thinner than the rest of the coolant lines in the vehicle. So it's not a restrictor in a traditional form, if I'm not mistaken, because a traditional restrictor would be actually uh, just taking apart that line. But because it is a smaller line in general, it does restrict the flow to the ADOS board, which makes sense because those coolant channels within that board plate are a bit smaller than the rest of the system. This video is sponsored by Anchor and their GAN Prime multi-device fast charging lineup. Now you can charge all your devices at once with GAN Prime, Anchor's most intelligent multi-device fast charging system. Built with an all GAN structure, Anchor GAN Prime chargers take full advantage of GAN to reduce energy loss and improve circuit efficiency. By using an innovative interlocking structure and stacked architecture, Anchor was able to reduce the size of their charger by 53% while also lowering the operating temperature. This temperature reduction can protect the charger to ensure it lasts up to 2.4 times longer.
greatly improve your charging experience today with Anchor GAN Prime. This is an actuator. Well, this connects to an actuator. This is the valve in and of itself. And this will be used to restrict flow to the rear motor. So whether or not flow is needed and the rear and front motor is driving in that direction. Um, it actually, os it turns 100, not 180 degrees, pardon me, 90 degrees, all the way up or all the way down. So that way you can, you can either have zero flow or 100% flow to the rear motors. So likely this is just a add on in case the motors are getting too hot and you need some more coolant flow. Yeah. And now, let's, since you mentioned the motors, let's talk about how the ethylene glycol flows through the motors. They are flowing the fluid directly into the, the motor housing and the inverter housing. They're not relying on a plate heat exchanger to exchange with the gear oil. I know that with, I believe, the, the Tesla Model S Plaid, the Model 3, and the Model Y, there's a plate heat exchanger, and they have gear oil that's actually pumped through the stator, and then they'll take all of the, the, that fluid and interface it with the plate heat exchanger to then extract that heat. They're pumping the, the ethylene glycol directly into the stator, the motor, um, and cooling it, or heating it. I don't think you would be heating the motor, but cooling it that way. The reason that's important is that eliminates the need for a relatively expensive uh, gear oil pump. And we've seen those gear oil pumps on the Ford F-150 Lightning, and the Tesla products and their high dollar items that's not needed if you're pumping the fluid directly into the motor. So that's something that, that we really like. There's also no PTC heater for the ethylene glycol fluid. They are using the, the chiller in essentially in reverse, kind of like a heat pump. And they're using the waste heat from the motors and the other electronics to heat the battery. Yeah, actually, speaking of the other electronics, this is one of our DC-DC converters. The Rivian had two of these modules identical to one another on the right and left. And like I said earlier, these would be seated on top of the onboard charger. And I guess I wanted to show off the active cooling that they had in here as well, because this, um, I believe that this is a thermal putty of some kind, just mm -hmm. connecting the cooling line, which is a pretty simple solution to the ADOS board and the onboard charger with both have inherent coolant channels made into the bottom of the housing in order to have active cooling. So I thought that that was pretty cool that they had that distinction between the DC-DC converters and the ADOS. Yeah. My favorite part about EV thermal systems is that the range of temperature that you're dealing with is less than an internal combustion engine vehicle. Some people forget that when you have a gallon of gasoline, there's a tremendous amount of energy, BTUs per unit volume, but most of that is lost to thermal losses. So all of those thermal losses in an internal combustion engine vehicle have to be dealt with with the coolant system, the traditional radiator and pipes and hoses that are there. The, the high-end temperatures you're dealing with here are much lower, but it's also more important for an EV to keep the battery at a certain temperature. So energy generation is more costly on an EV because you don't have all that free waste heat from the, the loss of the of the heat and the thermodynamic cycle for, for gasoline or diesel engines. Um, and it's much more, much more costly when you have PTC heaters and plate heat exchangers versus that free waste energy uh, from the gasoline or diesel. And that's why there's a, there's a big hyper focus on these thermal systems because in, in my opinion, it's the third most important system in EV. The most important system in EV is the battery battery technology and what you get out of the volumetric and gravimetric efficiency is important. The second most important is your motors, but motor technology has been developed over the last hundred years and it's really advanced. It just comes down to how much you want to spend on your motors, whether you want high-end magnets, um, high-end materials, high RPMs. Um, you can get pretty creative with your motors. And then the third is thermal systems. So thermal systems is is very, very important to keep not only your motor and your battery at the right temperature, but to keep the cabin comfortable to what people expect. People expect their vehicle to heat up quickly in the winter and cool down quickly in the summer. And some of these EV startups are really challenged by getting that same level of customer satisfaction through all these components. So hopefully today, Alex and I ran you through some of the pieces and parts that we see on the Rivian R1T, and you have a little bit better of an understanding of what goes into the thermal system of an EV. Um, we see this stuff all day long. 
We have multiple EVs in this, in this building. And if I had to give this a grade, I would give it a B or maybe a B plus. I find it very well executed from a material perspective. Uh, the fact they don't have a PTC heater generating heat uh, for the ethylene glycol is a huge cost savings. It's not a heat pump system, so maybe in very, very cold scenarios, you may struggle to generate that, that heat in your cabin using the uh, traditional electric PTC heater. Um, but what are your thoughts, Alex? Yeah, and honestly, I really enjoyed working on the Rivian and kind of taking this apart. Obviously, because I'm a co-op, I haven't seen as many EVs as you have, but I was able to take a look at the Tesla system when we had the S-Plaid. So looking at a system that it's more simplified, but it does what it has to do. So it's able to achieve the goals necessary without an octave valve or a coolant manifold. And even though those are super cool pieces of technology that I'd love to get into, I think I have a lot of respect for this system and the fact that it is able to do what it has to do and it is able to do it successfully. All right. Well, I think that wraps it up. Thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate you watching Monroe Live. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. It's very easy. Just hit the button <laughs> and uh, we can create more content for you on this channel. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.